Okay, thank you Thanks for the remind yep. reminder. So um, we are hosting the Science of Reading What I Should Have Learned in College is hosting a monthly series for as long as it takes to, to go through the January distinct magazines articles on uh, structured structured help, <laughs> help me out structured linguistic literacy Donna. thank I, you i get I, the brain until i'm brain dead <laughs> or known some people are calling it a speech to print approach and so the entire distinct magazine um january edition was devoted to that and so we are we are working our way through having the authors of every of the of the articles to present and so tonight is um Nora Chabazi's turn. And uh, so let me first tell you what Distinct is about. What is Distinct? It's, it was a magazine that was launched in 2021 as a resource for families and educators of children and young people with learning difficulties. Not every dyslexic child is magically a genius. Oftentimes, parents spend hours looking for the genius or outside the box thinking in their dyslexic children, failing to realize that it was them in them all along, hidden in plain sight under the years of self-doubt and shame that the society ingrained in them for not matching up to their peers. Distinct aims to peel back at those negative layers of damaged self-esteem and provide children with a platform to truly appreciate their uniqueness, take pride in their differences, and revel in the knowledge that within their differences lies their strength. So if you go on to the Distinct site, you will see that it's very child-centered focused, this magazine, and um, we appreciate all the work that has been put into it. Now for tonight's... Um, presentation. Uh, Nora Chapazzi comes to us as the creator of EBLE, which stands for Evidence-Based Literacy Instruction. For 20 years, she has provided EBLE training, coaching, and support to thousands of classroom intervention and private practice educators, hailing from 37 states and nine countries. Nora has also taught EBLE to countless students of all ages and abilities. She was the literacy consultant for the documentary, The Truth About Reading. Truth about reading. Nora is a presenter and has been interviewed for many print and audio sources, including Emily Hanford's Sold a Story podcast and At a Loss for Words, Oprah Radio, where she was interviewed by Maya Angelou, and Distinct Magazine's issue on structured linguistic literacy. Her life's work is to teach the world to read. And Nora, I know you as a friend and as a professional, and you are hands down the most passionate, compassionate person I know in regards to um, literacy. And it is an honor to know you and to work with you. And without further ado, Nora Chavazzi. Well, thank you, Donna. What kind words for sure. That's quite an honor to hear that from you. So I'm glad that you all are here. I'm very much looking forward to sharing with you about structured linguistic literacy and hopefully providing some clarity because it really is a hard you know, to understand the comparison and why we, you know, close the gap so quickly and how we do that and trying to explain it in words can be can be challenging. So before I share my screen, I'd love to ask that you all share where you're hailing from on this webinar in the in the chat so I can look at that later. And um, you really what brings you here. And um, I'm really, really very happy that all of you are here. If you have questions along the way as we're going, please feel free to put them in the chat and Donna will grab those. Um, and and ask them um, as we go or at the end or however it works the best. So we, we will get to those. We also have some people on here from the Ebley team. And sometimes when I talk about stuff, they're used to throwing links to the things in um, in the chat. So I've got some books and different kinds of things that we, we have some links for it too. So we will be doing that. And I do wanna say too that, you know, a lot of people have said, wow, it's so interesting that there's this whole new way of teaching and really it's very old. Um, 25 years ago when I learned about it, it had already been around for a couple of decades. So it's it's been kind of underground, but it has been um, you know, a lot more awareness coming to it. And it, it's different, which can cause discomfort, you know, and that cognitive dissonance sometimes. And that's completely normal and perfectly fine. Um, obviously. And so I'm just here tonight to, to give you guys more information, more clarity. I'm not asking anybody to do anything. I just want to increase awareness about what is this and what is it not that we have been talking about with this structured linguistic literacy. So with that, I'll share my screen and we will get going. All right. So 
looks like my head's floating there. Uh, let's see. And off we go. Um, let's see. Okay, so wait, did I hope I did that right? Okay, all right. So tonight, again, we're talking about how and why structured linguistic literacy closes the gap quickly, some of the differences of how it's different and why it's different, and also what it looks like, because I think that that helps a bunch. So uh, first, we're going to start out with a definition. Now, um, it, you might be wondering where this definition came from. So I'm going to talk about that for a minute before I, I delve deeper into this. Um, over the past couple of years, actually, um, even Donna, who I met, I think it was either right after she started her page or right before, whatever, I don't know when, it was at 2019 at Plain Talk. And um, over time, she had learned about structured linguistic literacy, linguistic phonics, a speech to print approach. And she was like, I'm not so sure about this and kept learning more and learning more. And then was... Um, you know, has been very grand to host these things, to, to be on a group. She actually suggested that we kind of get a group of people to help um, increase awareness and give clarity around what this approach is that we're really talking about. So every other week, Donna and myself and Marnie Ginsberg, who started Reading Simplified, and Stephen Tretch up in Canada, who has also has a structured linguistic literacy program, and Nikki Ott from the um, Facebook page, Structured Linguistic Literacy and, and Linguistic Phonics, and a few more of us get together. Um, Janine Heron is another one, but several of us get together every other week and try to, you know, like I said, provide information and all of that to, to people. And we worked over several sessions collaboratively to come up with a definition of what could we say in a sentence that would describe this because we were calling it speech to print and people said, everybody who does spelling does speech to print. Um, you know, and print to speech is, is reading. And we're like, well, no, it's not speech to print as far as spelling. And also there's Louisa Mott's book, Speech to Print. So there was a lot of confusion with that. And we didn't feel comfortable using that term. And then linguistic phonics, which Diane McGinnis really, you know, she has a, a prototype of linguistic phonics. And that's where it came from for me and, you know, what many of us talked about. But it's not exactly even really that. And plus, there's also linguistic approach and linguistic other things that was causing confusion with that term. So that's where we came up with this term, structured linguistic literacy or SLL, okay? And this is the definition. It's an accelerated, systematic, explicit, and integrated, integrated is very important, instructional speech first approach to reading and spelling, spelling and reading. So this is it in a nutshell. And in this presentation, we kind of elaborated on these things to really kind of tease apart what are the things that make it unique and different across all of those who have a system or a program that teaches it? Because Reading Simplified does a little different than Sounds Right, than Ebly, than you know, whatever pro program or system that it is. But there's a certain solid foundation that surrounds all of those who do the structural linguistic literacy. Okay, so that's what we're going to be talking about. Now, for me and the work I do, what uh, our strength is the most with Ebly and with uh, how we train teachers and teach kids is to focus on that bridge from, yeah, you know what, this is what the research shows, this is what our brain is doing, this is all these things, but where is that bridge to what we actually do in the classroom or in private practice or, or intervention or remediation with the learner or learners? So we, I, I like to focus on um, this information from that angle. So I'm going to be kind of coming from that angle uh, throughout this whole presentation about what does this look like when you're actually working with a student. I'm not really good at abstract, like trying to figure that out in my head without having an example. So that's my, you know, uh, way that's very helpful to help me understand things. So I'm, uh, you know, I basically teach that way to teachers and on a webinar and to kids and all of that too. Okay. So um, to start out with, um, I want to talk about how speaking is biologically primary. It basically means that we're born that, and we're wired and we're natural to do that, okay, to be able to talk. It's natural for us. <laughs> Reading and writing are biologically secondary. Something that's biologically secondary is th those are things that you have to be taught to do right? So reading is one of them and spelling is one of them. We're using a, a code that's man-made. It's not natural. It's man-made that was created so that we could communicate with each other when we weren't, you know, in uh, contact, like in the same place together so that you could communicate. Um, and both with 
reading, which we're picking up somebody else's talk. So writing is talk written down and reading is picking up someone else's talk off the page. All right. And those we have to use this man-made alphabetic code that in order to, to most effectively and efficiently utilize it, um, you need to be taught how to do it. Okay. So I always think and talk to kids about that when you have a book and you are picking the words up off the page by reading what somebody else is saying, it's their talk written down and you get to pick it up whether they were alive 300 years ago or whether they're across the world or whatever. You can take their talk that's coded down onto paper or a phone or a computer in letters as the code and pick that back up if you know the code, right, to be able to read it. So that's what we're wanting to do is that deal with that biologically secondary reading and writing and by really most strongly utilizing what comes to us naturally, which is speaking. Okay, so that's the whole goal and what we're doing. All right, so I just want to uh, talk about a man-made code for a second. This is a really simple code that I made. So, um, and I'm going to have you just decode the first word if you want. You can put it in the chat, maybe the first two. So I'm going to tell you about my code. In this code, the first letter is the same as the first letter in an English code. So the H is a H, it's the same as the other letters are created from my code. Okay, so I want to know if you can figure out at least the first word and from my code and then put it into the chat. Okay, so if take just about 10 seconds, type in the chat if you would like what you think my first word, not my first letter, but my first word is there. If you get to the second word, you can try that too. And what do you think we got going on? His, how, his, okay, we got his and how as our, his crime, her child. We got a bunch of, of choices here. And what I like to do this activity with, if you have seen my webinars before, probably it's been a couple of years where I did this, where I've made this actual code. Um, and to show you, if you know the first letter, which is oftentimes we tell kids, especially if we're going from a holistic reading, we want them to read fast and we go kind of whole word memorization. We often say, what's the first sound? And then the rest of the word, or look at the first sound and guess that type of thing. So if you know the first letter, we have a, obviously with our different answers, we have a lot of variety of what could be the rest of the letters or what really what could be the word. So I'm going to show you my code is right here. So with this code, every letter, but the first letter is so if it's the letter A, if I had an A in the word, the next, the word in my, the letter in my code would a B, be a B. If I had an N, it would be a O. So here, H, so it's the letter before if I'm trying to decode. So if I'm encoding, that's what I'm doing is using the next letter, which is a lot easier than the other way backwards. So the F is actually E and the S is actually an R. So this first word is her. And then this one is child. Now, now that you know the code and I taught it to you, which is a tremendously si simple code, unlike the English alphabetic code, to be perfectly honest, <laughs> um, it's very, very simple. You could, you would be able to decode and faster and faster anything that I taught you. Okay. So that's a very simple code. Now, the other thing with this code, if we were to be looking at it, we can't, it doesn't go by letter by letter by letter because English is different in that, as you see in this purple, we can have two letter spellings or three letter spellings, still one sound. And the green here, this is a spelling for er, two letters. And this is a spelling for er, these three letters. Okay. So we have the same exact sound. It can be spelled in a lot of different ways. Then we have another concept that's unique because we borrowed from a bunch of different spellings from different uh, languages or different countries and layer languages is where here in child, this, the spelling that goes, or the sound that goes with this spelling is I, ch, I, but in it, now it's I, okay? So it's the same spelling now, but it's a different sound. The same thing with this spelling in O, in so, and then the same spelling is oo in two. So there's all kinds of complications in English that especially if you don't, the simple code, you would look at that and you're like, that gives me a headache, right? Because especially if you don't know how to deal with it, the simple code is challenging enough. But when you have a complex code that has these concepts that can you know, cause a lot of confusion, that really increases the level of complexity, okay? And challenge and the need to explicitly teach how that code works, all right? So um, there's something in the middle of my, oh, closed captioning, okay. So what is unique about a structured linguistic literacy approach? I really like this picture with that cute little white guy. 
ghosty guy sticking his head out there. So what is unique? That's what I'm going to be talking about. What is different than what most people are familiar with, with how this approach of delivering the instruction is when you're teaching structured linguistic literacy. And for me, the best way to do that, all of us, um, John Walker, Marty Ginsburg, anybody that I know that has created their structured linguistic literacy system, um, really laments, and even anybody that's used one, laments how hard it is to try to explain in words what it is. So what I was going to do, instead of telling to start out with, I'm going to show. Okay, so we're going to have show and tell tonight. So I'm going to show you about a five-minute video. And this is a video that we actually use um, for people interested in, in our system um, so that they can see, and this is a kindergarten one. We have them for all the different grades or even intervention, that so that you can see what do these um, activities that we're using this approach with, what do they look like in practice with children from the beginning of when you're teaching them to the gradual, re gradual release where you fade away to more and more independence. So that we're gonna have a little bit of a movie time for about five minutes, all right, so that you can see. If you have any questions, type them in the chat. Um, and then after I show you that video, we're gonna talk about through the, you know, kind of a drill down into that definition of structural linguistic literacy in the, in the things that are unique and also how that applies you know, to that instruction, okay? So here we go. And hopefully you can hear it, oopsie. All right, hold on, oopsie. Oh no, this was working when I first, oh, sugar jets. Okay, so hold on. I'm getting good at um, having issues and dealing with them with technology because they're not my my fun thing. All right, so I'm gonna find it here. So it's not gonna be cut like it was, but I will stop it so you don't have to get into the writing and all that good stuff. And we could also share, if you wanna see the whole thing because it is cut, um, we can share it. Uh, and hopefully I've shared my audio, but you can tell me, okay. Hello. So the goal of this can video you guys hear it? Like somebody it, tell me is to give you an overview up? what your student instruction is going to look okay. like um, if with Ebley in your classroom. So when you first start teaching it, and some future lessons, it will do okay. a year. The very first activity your students will experience, and one they will do several times in future lessons, is an Ebley morning message. This message includes sentences incorporated into a note from me. This is a controlled activity where students parrot the sounds, the blending of the words, and the reading of the sentences. The goal of this activity is to give your students exposure to and practice with experiencing many of the components of reading and writing. Many of the beginning lessons contain phonemic awareness activities done orally. These include activities to teach blending sounds into words and segmenting words into sounds, as well as rhyming instruction and practice. Your kindergartners will be taught the most common sounds that go with each of the letters, as well as explicit instruction in handwriting in the say and pull activity using CVC, meaning consonant, vowel, consonant, CVCC, and CCVC words. This allows sounds for letters to be taught in the context of a word, as opposed to in isolation, which makes the instruction meaningful and relevant to students, as well as helps them understand how sounds and letters are put together to make words. Along with this activity, you will be given materials to connect your lessons to student reading and text. This will be done whole group with sentence reading, as well as through small group instruction, where you can differentiate your instruction as you assist each of your students in reading decodable text at first. Stories will be provided in these lessons, as well as links to other decodable books that match the lesson taught. You may use any decodable text that matches the lesson. Once your students become more adept at reading, you will be using trade books while supporting them in small group reading. Phony manipulation, the third and most challenging phonemic awareness skill, will be taught using letters, as well as visual cues, such as dots and fingers, along the way to teaching students how to do this activity orally. Keeping with the gradual release practice for all Ebley instruction, your students will then graduate to the sound line activity, an activity that allows students to learn the more complex code of two, three, and four letter spelling, auditorily first, 
and then visually with letters. Your students will be taught the consonant E or magic E lesson in a way that helps them integrate and apply this with ease. The concept of the same sound in English being spelled in many different ways will be taught through sorts, starting with sounds that are spelled in two different ways and moving to sounds that have many spellings. This activity allows the concept to be taught in a way that allows your students to learn patterns pertaining to where the various spellings are typically used in a word and avoids inconsistent phonics rules. These sorts can be transferred to chart paper to create a sound wall in your room for students to reference and add to. Once students have begun learning about multiple letters spelling one sound and multiple ways to spell each sound, they will be taught a multi-syllable strategy using the same sound line process they are familiar with, adding additional steps with syllables. The Ebley multi-syllable strategy is consistent across all multi-syllable instruction, including reading and spelling multi-syllable words. The multi-syllable split word reading activity is taught frequently and allows students to manage longer words, unfamiliar code, and practice the skill of phony manipulation within words each time error corrections are done. Your students will learn the concept of the same spelling representing several different sounds in a sort activity. This activity helps strengthen your students' auditory processing and auditory discrimination, as well as application of the skill of phony manipulation or moving sounds around in words. Vocabulary instruction is incorporated in all instruction with Ebley, briefly discussing the meaning of any unfamiliar word you are teaching in a sort or lesson. There are also other explicit vocabulary activities in Ebley that would be taught further along in the year. Fluency is trained with Ebley whenever you are reading with your students, whether they are reading just one sentence at a time or an entire paragraph. Students are taught to run their fingers smoothly under the words to increase fluency and improve inflection. Comprehension is always the end goal of all reading instruction. However, this is done more with read-alouds at first for beginning readers. Read-alouds strengthen listening comprehension, improve vocabulary, provide background knowledge, and allow for comprehension discussions with students. This allows students the transitional time to apply what they have been learning to reading until they become automatic at accurate reading and then comprehend what they are reading on their own. It also avoids the need for inefficient strategies that create bad habits as they are learning to read, such as whole word memorizing, guessing words, or looking at the pictures to figure out unknown words. Spelling and writing instruction are embedded all through the Ebley lessons. When students have been taught various spellings for sounds, they then not only read text using these letters along with those previously taught, but they write sentences with them. This is the lesson to application match, providing explicit instruction, then applying what was learned in both reading and writing. Explicit spelling instruction is taught within all of the Ebley activities, helping students understand the code is reversible, using decoding or reading and encoding spelling. Spelling is also taught in writing, utilizing the Ebley practice of teaching multiple components of literacy in every activity taught. Ebley has many phases of writing that are scaffolded from simple, concrete. Okay. And I'm going to stop there um, because, you know, that is, again, focused on Ebley instruction, of course, but I, the writing is a little bit different. How we apply it, whoever is doing, um, Hold on a second. Let me not multitask here while I'm on the correct slide. Let's do that. Whoever is doing, you know, how they're doing the instruction um, differs, again, between different systems, like, like all of that. But the basic foundational pieces that you saw there, and I'm going to elaborate on, are the same across structured linguistic literacy of any system that is being used, okay? So first, the first thing is that when we want to drill down on the definition of structured linguistic literacy is the alphabetic principle, okay? So matching the sounds from words that come out of our mouth, all right, the words that come out, pulling apart the sounds, matching them to the letters in that order, right? And then picking them back up to read them. So we're doing de encoding to be able to decode. And I'll talk more about that. So we're going to organize the code, not by the letters, which are man-made and artificial and created, but by our, our words, the words coming out of our mouth in the speech, all right, and then match those, uh, you know, put them on a placeholder and then match the spellings to those sounds. So it's kind of a complete backward switch um, with that. So the speech 
is the is the lead. We lead with the speech instead of leading with the letters. Okay, so these words come out of our mouth. They're um, we we put them down in print. Basically, we're going to teach our kids how to do that. Of course, and then we're going to read. We're going to pick them back up um, off the page to be able to decode them. So, what is taught in an alphabetic uh, when we're with the alphabetic principle in structured linguistic literacy is we start with the whole word orally, not the word where you can see it. So, if you see an ex the example here, we, we've got the word peace, and you know, up here are the kids. At first, the first part that's going to happen is they put placeholders. The word is peace. What are the sounds? P peace. So they have placeholders for the word. Now, what's critical for us is that at this point, now when they're brand new readers, we do things a little bit differently. But here, across, you know, in an accelerating reading, they don't see the word or the letters yet. That decreases letter name interference. It helps them pay more attention to what are we, our ears hearing our mouth say, uh, uh, and what is our mouth saying so our ears can hear. And then, so they put those placeholders. Then, as you can see in the bottom picture, we show them the word, and then they match their spellings after that. So it's not starting with the letters. It's starting with the sounds, then the placeholder, or they build a word if we're doing that. And then they write the spellings, and then they read the words. So they're decoding first, or yes, encoding first, and then picking it off the off, off the page to decode, which is a really complete switch from traditional phonics, all right, um, as far as that goes. So this is what we don't, be, by doing it that way with starting with speech and giving our kids a head start because they come to school with speech, right, and so we're going to capitalize on what they already know, um, these are some things that we don't need. We don't ever have to teach a letter in isolation. We don't have to say this is B or B is B, bat. We, we, any, if any instruction um, in initial instruction with uh, structural linguistic literacy starts with the whole word, the word like with us with kindergarten, we start with at, okay? What are the sounds in at, at? Then they put the lines down and then we either, we build it or, um, and then they say as they write the word at, okay? And then they read it. So we're doing the spelling part first and then the reading part. So there's never anywhere a uh, reason or need to take time to teach any spellings or letters to pre-teach them. We don't have to do that, all right? So it saves a lot of time with that. And also we don't have to use letter names. We teach letter names during, with Ebley anyway, during handwriting. We don't use letter names when we're, if we're using the speech, no consonant actually is the same, sound is the same as its letter name, right? Every consonant sound, the, you know, letter name is at least two sounds long. So we have to go with the sounds. And if the vowel, like O and go, you know, go, we would obviously say the letter name for the vowel if that's the sound that it's representing. But otherwise, we don't need any letter names, which is, again, takes away, decreases a lot of instructional time. The other thing that we don't need are rules because, again, we're going from what we're saying to what we're seeing down here. And as you see, like when we were sorting the sound E, we point out the patterns or tendencies of several different ways to spell a sound that then kids apply and moves them to self-teaching much more quickly. All right, so these are a lot of things that often take up a lot of instructional time and we can completely circumvent and bypass them when we start with speech first, which is very exciting. All right, so the nature of the code, and you saw this in the video, and this is with structured linguistic literacy. We talk about up to four letters can spell a sound. So you see here, one, two, three, four letters, one sound out of our mouth. All four of these words are two sounds long. Okay, no different than it, right? W A, er, n. It's two sounds long. Okay, but the difference is, is that we have up to four letters that can spell a sound. So that's the first concept that um, in more transparent, simple codes, that is not an issue. But in the English alphabetic code, we need to teach our kids how that and also how to deal with that. The second concept over here, we have an example with a sound s, is that the exact same sound can be spelled in a lot of different ways. So it's helping our kids to organize that information and then look at, while it's all together, the patterns that you see of where you use typically, because nothing in English is always, but typically use those spellings in a word, okay? And then you don't have to teach, you only have to teach so much explicitly because it very quickly starts being applied to um, all the other stuff that they're doing. You don't have to teach all of the code, like all the ways to spell 44 sounds. Um, you, you teach them this concept 
and then they apply it because they understand the logic of how that works. And then the third one is, is that we can be looking at the exact same spelling and we can be hearing a different sound. So this can be like in cat or like in scent. I can't see the words on there, but um, I know they're longer ones. So that same spelling, whether it's a vowel or a consonant, right? They can have the same, not all of the spellings, but some of the same, some of the spellings, the same exact letter or letters can represent a lot of different sounds. And our kids need to understand how to actually deal with these concepts in the English alphabetic code. So in structured linguistic literacy, almost immediately, especially if we were talking second grade and older, or in you know, mid or later first grade and older, at the beginning, this is what we teach first. Again, because we're going with what they're speaking, we don't have to start all the way back at where we would with kindergartners, um, even in remediation to teach these concepts. So these concepts are the underpinnings and they're holding up regardless of who's, what system or program or whatever it is. This is what is that foundation of all of the work that's being done, okay? And then the nuances of the nature of the code, all right? So the meaning, orthography, morphology, phonology, all of these things, when you're starting with the word and you're teasing it apart for each of the sounds and you're matching the spelling or the code to it, and then you're bringing it back up to read, all of it is very obvious to your learners that it's reversible. OK, um, you're using the same code with reading and spelling. So it's integrated. Every activity that we do with Ebley and that anybody does with structural linguistic literacy has many components in it. We teach we don't teach much at all. We teach a little bit of phonemic awareness at the beginning of kindergarten. And I mean a very little bit because it's integrate. I mean, segmenting and blending is everything that we do, but also um, phony manipulation and substitution, you have to do all the time when you are when you have the word, uh, let's say, scent, and you say, -ent -kent, you have to pull out that s and push in the k. So we're doing phony and substitution all the time, all the time. So uh, our learners become very automatic at that and understand how to do that set for variability and flexing mm -hmm. the sound, both vowels and consonants, okay? So Another thing too, along with the, with the integration, and what I mean is, so if we're teaching the five essential components of, of reading, as well as writing, spelling, and handwriting, I, we do handwriting in every two, but if you're teaching all of those things, um, we don't have to teach them separately. We teach many of those eight things in every single activity that we teach. And we teach them with interleaving, where there's this spiraling and revisiting as you go. So you don't have to do as much explicit instruction and kind of drill on that because you do explicit instruction, you do a, a little bit of um, practice, right? With whatever the spellings are that we're doing, and then you apply it. The application is the key, not the skills that you're doing over here, but you learn those things explicitly, you practice a little bit, then you apply it to connected reading as well as writing, all right? So that's really, really, um, uh, critical and how we move to the students moving to self-teaching. People are like, how can they move where they're this fast? We, we get that question a lot. How is this possible that this is this fast? And it's because these kids are moving to self-teaching that statistical learning because they know these concepts and it's much easier to apply that instead of having to wait for a long, long time until we get to whatever the spelling is that you haven't been taught yet. So you don't get exposure to it in that connected text, okay? Um, and the set for variability is happening all the time. It's and it's actually woven right into the instruction to practice that so kids are very automatic at it. So all of these things, we talk about prefixes and suffixes and root words and vocabulary and what it means and all of that together, all right? Makes it meaningful, makes it relevant, it makes it buzzing into those neural pathways much quicker. Okay. So these are the things that we don't need. We don't need to teach all, we don't need to teach, oh, look at that, it goes sparkly, that's fun. I didn't know how, oh, it's doing it on its own. You, we don't need to teach spelling at nine to 10 and phonics at 10 to 11 and phonemic awareness at 11 to 12 and comprehension. We don't separate all of these things, all right? We don't do that and to have to do it in isolation, which takes, again, a lot more of our instructional time. So that, when it's integrated, um, speeds things up an awful lot, all right, and closes the gap quickly or prevents a gap from 
from ever happening in the first place, which is really my favorite part, uh, is what we want. We don't need syllable types and rules because the letters and the print are not what's leading the instruction. Our speech is what's leading the instruction, okay? So we don't ever teach a rule or types or, or all of that type of thing. We we teach with how our words fall out of our mouth. And, um, and kids learn how to... Um, what do I want to say? Gra be gradually released to independence much more quickly, which is fun. And we also don't wait for mastery before moving on because that interleaving and spiraling, we're going to continue. Nothing's ever going to get left behind, right? We're going to, especially if we're doing a lot of reading and a lot of writing and a lot of accelerating and um, using more challenging words and all that kind of good stuff. That's uh, everything that we've taught before. Our kids are going to come across when they're reading novels and all that good stuff too. So we don't need to get to mastery before we move on. Following the, you know, the science of learning, which shows that that interleaving is, is the key as opposed to mastery. So we're, again, we're gonna teach integrated. This is really, I've said it many, many times, but it's really important. That integration of all of these things that move it forward faster is critical. Multimodal, all right, we're going to be teaching many different seeing, hearing, saying, touching, all of that stuff in one uh, action that they're doing or one activity that they're doing. Um, and then our scaffolding and error corrections are immediate. We start off and, and think I just used this in a, actually a Facebook post recently, thinking of kids tying their shoes. All right. Now, we don't, they don't really have to shoes to tie anymore, really. But when we learned to tie our shoes, taught my kids to tie our shoes, okay, you, you could go to tie your shoe in a second, right? You don't even think about it. But when you stop to teach a child how to tie their shoe, I don't know if you've ever done it, but I think you should try it just because it's just like, whoa. When you think about how you drill down to that first step, what do I do first and what do I do next? And then what do I do next? And what's the order and how do I explain it and how do I show it? All of that scaffolding is what we weave through in structured linguistic literacy too, with everything that we're doing. I do, we do, you do, we're going to model, we're going to do it together, then we're going to model, then we're going to do it together. I do, we do, we do, we do, I do, we do, you do. You know, so we're going to, again, that interleaving piece and the error corrections happen immediately. So what's in, imprinted on their neural pathways is the correct word read or the correct spelling in the word, okay? So um, what is taught here? So the many, uh, an example of teaching multiple processes simultaneously. So the word climb, all right? We're gonna put the lines or the placeholders, k, l, i, m, all right? They have segmented those sounds, right? And put a placeholder down for them. Now they're going to say as they write, k, l, i, m. So they're sequencing, they're doing um, simultaneous processing. They have to pull, unless we show them the word, they have to pull that code, retrieval of the code when they're gonna do the spelling for it, all right? They have to do simultaneous processing. They have to remember, there's so many things that they're doing to fertilize their brain and grow it. And then if they get caught or there's a snag, we give them the information. We don't force them to recall because if they would have knew how to recall it, they would have recalled it, right? So we don't force them to start, you know, go through that frustration of that. We give them the information that they need. So we speed up that instruction tremendously. Um, we're doing a whole lot of cognitive processes along with a lot of other things all at one time. Um, and then multimodal, again, when you're writing the word climb, k, l, i, m, we're seeing it, we're saying it, we're hearing it, we're touching it. It's going to help us again, integrate it and move to that learning much faster. And then corrective feedback. If we're, this is actually the town I was born and raised in it in Michigan. So it has this letter in it three times. It's a different sound every time, by the way. So if somebody were to read this as, let's say, ah, okay. So somebody says, ah, I, the teacher would say, say, oh, or no, ah, uh, ah, uh, I know my town, ah, uh, say, ah. Uh. So then I'm going to do phoneme substitution and say, ah. Uh. So I get that uh, feedback in a moment. This class I was teaching today of 30 kids, and we were doing several words. One was like six syllables, anywhere from three to six syllables. One person in the class says the wrong thing. I tell them, say shh, or whatever it need to be, okay? So we give that feedback in the moment so you can move to correct, um, you know, reading of the word. And so this is uh, and then wa, ah. So they say ah, wa. So then we put together ah, wa, s, ah. And then I'd say, say oh, oh. We pull out the ah, push in the oh, s, oh, so. Awaso. So that corrective feedback happens right now. Right now. So you fixed it, you've changed it, you've done that, 
you know, uh, pulling out the phoneme substitution, which is the whole point why we learn phoneme substitution uh, to do it because we have to do it in basically every multi-syllable word and quite frankly, in a lot of one syllable words too. So we wanna give that correct information. So, and, and the science of learning also says that we wanna have challenge and struggle, but the corrective feedback has to be there immediately before they finish what it is that you're doing, okay? So that's really key to what we do too. Whoa, 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 what are we doing here? Okay, so this is what is not needed, mastery, which I talked about. And this, I like all these islands because this is really what I think about is like, we've got this over here and this over here. And what happens with island teaching is what I call it. If we do isolated instruction or spelling here and vocabulary there and phonemic awareness here, separated from phonics over there or whatever, when we do that, our kids don't understand how all of these things connect together unless we give them really explicitly information about that. But even so, they're like, wait a minute, here I'm supposed to be doing spelling and now I'm supposed to be doing the vocabulary and this is supposed to be a phonemic awareness thing. They think in that isolated island um, mindset too. So we don't want them to do that. We want to understand that it's all tied together. We don't put the car engine over here and the you know carburetor over there and the tires over there and the seats over here. All together is how it needs, they need to be utilized. All right. So that's how we do our teaching. Okay. Why are we teaching it? Logical. Kids are so, especially kids who have had intervention for years, they're just so relieved. Like, oh my gosh, this actually, there's a logic to this that makes sense. That's, it's just like a tremendous relief because it, there is a system of logic that can be taught. And once you know it, it takes away a ton of anxiety and helps you understand how does this code work? It's just like any code, like coding a computer. I don't know that code. Those of you who know that code, I'm really impressed, but there's a logic to it. You can learn it, right? But you have to know what that logic is. It's very, very efficient. So we can move kids far or adults and fast and whole groups of kids, whether they're in kindergarten or 10th grade, move them very quickly. And the transference, so many times when I'm working in schools, kids have gotten tons of, of, I don't know, let's say spelling instruction or whatever it may be. And they like, oh my gosh, look at me doing so well in this spelling when I'm doing this in this situation. And now I'm going to go, my own daughter was one of these, by the way, I'm going to go or on a spelling test, they can do well. I'm going to go over here and write. And the words I just spelled right there, I'm misspelling here. So that's not really very efficient use of time and energy because we don't have that transference. If we're going to be teaching something, we want it to transfer to automatic and accurate reading and connected text and automatic and accurate spelling and connected writing. Okay. So that transference is important and quick transference is even better. Okay. All right. So why are we teaching it? Again, we decrease the cognitive load. We really, we take a lot of weight off the brain, give it a big old breather, like, all right, we're not gonna try to shove more stuff in here that may or may not be meaningful or relevant, or you don't know how it applies, or you don't know like for this word, which of these things do I do? I've got five different ways of approaching a word and which one do I do? You know, how do I know which one I'm going to do? And also all kinds of other things that puts more information into a brain. We don't, we want to lift that out and clear out more so that it's lighter and easier as opposed to bog down our brain and our neural pathways. Okay. Um, we're teaching it so that our learners and our teachers, of course, understand the reversibility of the code. So we're teaching reading and spelling at the same time because they teach the same code. One is expressive writing. One is receptive reading. Reading is a lot easier than spelling, quite frankly. And spelling, regardless of what you use to teach spelling, is going to lag a bit behind um, reading, okay? But we teach them at the same time with the same skills, with the same concepts, and with the same information so that we can apply it and the kids can understand how to do it and use it, whether they're reading a birthday card or a menu or a novel, okay? Anything. Because what we're going to teach them can be applied to anything that they need to do to make their life easier. All right, so the goal of anybody, whoever teaches reading, and regardless of how you teach it, is high level literacy achievement for all. This is the goal. Let's move us to 100% proficient in reading, okay? 95, 100, whatever. Let's move all of our kids as high as they can go with reading, writing, and spelling. So that is what we are wanting to do. I know that's what you're wanting to do. And so, um, you know, these are the pieces that we utilize to be able to move that needle. And, um, you know, and approach that goal or get to that goal. Um, here are some resources if you want to learn more about structured linguistic um, learn, literacy learning 
for you. Um, I highly recommend the Facebook group, the Speech to Print Structured Linguistic Literacy Linguistic Phonics Exploration. This is truly an exploration page. Nikki is very good who runs this page about keeping it narrow focused on if you're exploring and wanting to learn more about this approach, I don't know, she's like the best detective ever to find everything that ever was about structured linguistic literacy. It's, this page has been around probably a year, a little over a year, maybe. And it's amazing to me how much I learned from it all the time. She's always finding more things and it's very uh, impressive for you to go there. And it's a very supportive group too. Also, Diane McGinnis, she is the pioneer really of the everyone that I know who does structured linguistic literacy, uh, their foundation was with Diane McGinnis or phonographics, which her son and daughter-in-law created and um, uses for the most part, a linguistic phonics prototype that she created. And, I, and I've got a link to that, that Cricket or Hannah, somebody will link that to you um, in, the, in the comments too. So you can have that. Also the first book that I read 25 years ago that br brought me to Teaching This Way, and still my favorite book on reading, I must say, Why Your Children Can't Read and What You Can Do About It by Diane McGinnis. Highly recommend that. That was in, I think, 97, and she had a revision in 99. And then also Early Reading Instruction, What the Science Really Tells Us About How to Teach Reading. It's a book of hers in 2004. It really is going to, and it's very different. I mean, as I was reading about phonics and about whole language back then, and even balanced literacy now, those things my daughter had been taught, and I knew that neither of them had worked for her. So I was searching for something else, right? And this is where um, Diane McGinnis, to me, in my opinion, and all as I know, there are other people again uh, of us who have who have elaborated on her work and all. But she is the queen. She passed away not long ago, unfortunately. But she is the queen, and I highly recommend her stuff if you're interested in in learning more about this approach and how it really is very different. And she kind of digs down into the into the weeds about it too lots of information. And that's all that I've got. So um, I will stop and see if we have any questions. We had a ton of dialogue going on while you yeah. were chatting. Oh, um, shoot, I missed it all. What what, what was you, happening? Yeah. Mm. Okay, so let me, I, I started recording. The first one is, uh, is the morning message only available for the kindergarten stage? We only use it at the kindergarten stage. Um, quite frankly, because I mean, you could, I suppose, at first grade if kids haven't had this instruction in kindergarten, but it is, it is exposure. It's not instruction. It's not explicit instruction or meant to be. But when you're showing them these concepts, it, actually a capital letter comes at the beginning of a sentence. There's one that, you know, so many classrooms of every grade level that I go into, that's not even, that's missing from these kids. So Starting right away, this is a capital letter. I talk about punctuation, all those kinds of things. One, two, three, and four letters can sell a sound. We, we expose them with parroting to a multi-syllable strategy. Um, we expose them to the same spelling with a different sound, same sound different spelling. Their brain are pat, brains are pattern-seeking missiles. So just this exposure alone, when you go to teach that explicitly after you've taught the one-letter spellings, they pick it up like champs. It's, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. So we do that with beginning. I mean, remediation, we might do it with first grade. But there's too many other more important things that need to be taught. So yes, that is a kindergarten focused thing. Okay, here's another one. I'm new to Emily. I'm not getting how the kids are writing the letters that go with the sounds if they haven't learned the letter sound connection. How do they know which grapheme to write? You show them. When you're starting with, if you're being trained in Emily, you will see that because they, if they're kindergarten, they start and they build the words so the letters are there. But most of us, middle, first grade and older, you are going to do those placeholders, then you show them the word and they match the spelling. So we're not asking them to pull it out of their brain because they don't have it there yet. So we give them that information. It's scaffolded and very, very explicit on what you need to do, the process. The process is much more important than the content or the information, like way more important. So doing that process and you know, and showing them the letters, you, you give them that information. That's how you teach it to them, yeah. Okay. Do you follow a scope and sequence? We do. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's easy. All right, now, this is where it got kind of too busy for me to... <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, uh, yeah, there, there was a whole lot. Um, where are we here? And uh, people were following, people were answering for you. Um, 
thank you people, my Evely peeps, I'm yeah. sure. Yep, that's exactly what it was. Um, I'm a third grade teacher. My son is Down syndrome and does not know all the alphabet yet. How can this work with him? Very well, I promise. Because if, if he's speaking, which I'm sure he's speaking, is that, and what you need is more repetition sometimes. The, the variation for Evely, because people are like, I need to know where to start. And we're like, you start at the first lesson. <laughs> That's what's the cool thing. You start for everybody. The differentiation happens. Well, and we have, obviously have different trainings. You don't start at the same place with a third grader as you would a first grader or a kindergartner. But the differentiation happens in the in the repetition, in the error correction, in the scaffolding, in the supports. Okay, so that's where the differentiation happens. But the Down syndrome, anybody, anybody, whoever it is, how they learn it is being in the context of a word, which makes it meaningful and relevant, is one of the most important things, right, to learn those spellings. Doing it in isolation, what does a book mean to anybody or us or any of that? You know, especially anybody nine years old and older or younger, and especially a child who has Down syndrome, which is like, okay, I'll say tss, or whatever you're wanting me to here, but what, I, what do I hook to that? Because that doesn't, I, you know, if I'm doing it in the word top or at, then I'm hooking it to something that I know, which is my speech. And, and so they learn that, that we need people to be researching this. I, I just hired a researcher today, by the way, very exciting stuff Yay. Here for me. Yeah, that's really, really exciting. Um, well, the, a person that's going to do some research, I should say, um, because I'm like, there's a lot of things I would like researched, but Having that, you know, that saying the sound as you write, to me, there was a whole discussion on a uh, listserv that I'm on that's like, there's no research for that. And I'm like, let me tell you what, I would not withhold that from any student. I wouldn't be able to do research on that because I wouldn't be able to have a control group of not saying the sounds as you write. It's that important. So that is absolutely critical absolutely critical and we know that so for those kids when they're when you're saying it and you're, you're making that motor movement to make that letter and you're saying the sound and you're here you know you're saying it and you're hearing it and you're touching it you're doing everything but licking it I think one of the girls in that video was licking her board actually but mostly they don't <laughs> lick the board so when you're doing that it helps with that uh you know in getting that into those neural pathways faster okay um Donna Nora, yes. can I ask just a really fast question? Yep. Uh, the the say as you write, I, I love it. I'm I'm excited to use this. I've been telling my kids that sometimes they tell me they're they're sounding it out in their head. Is that a, what do I say? I said, you know what? This is what I say because I hear that all the time. I'm not a very good mind reader yet, so I can't hear what's going on in your head. You use, and also you're probably not doing it very well. And you use different parts of your brain when you're saying it out loud, as opposed, both reading and doing this too, as opposed to saying in your head. Now think about if you're going to try to remember, okay, I'm going to go to the grocery store and I'm going to get these three, I'm going to get some yogurt. I'm going to get some vitamins. Okay. I know I'm going to say it out loud. I'm going to touch my fingers. I'm going to do it like three times or if I'm too lazy to put it in my phone, because I will forget it if I don't do that. So if I say it in my head, I'm not going to remember it. So saying it out, out, out of your mouth is critical. Okay. Also, you, the teacher, can't hear if they're truly segmenting or if they're slurry blending and that kind of thing. So that's what I tell them. Until I can read your mind and hear what's going on in there, you got to say it out of your mouth. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm a parent who was, who was not taught how to read correctly, and now I have kids exposed to the same thing in their school system where they are taught to memorize, not how to pronounce letters through sound. Where do I start in learning how to read and teach and teach my children? Um, yeah, that's tricky, isn't it? What I would say to you, what I would get is the book called Reading Reflex. It's like 10 bucks. Um, it's actually phonographics, which I learned at first and was trained in for, did, was a trainer for four years. It's a book that I actually taught my daughter to read um, when I was first starting on this journey. And uh, I don't know how old, but especially for younger kids, that's going to give you the information in the first part. And then it shows you the stuff to do. Um, that's going to be a great start. There's apps. We have apps. There's a free app called Ebley Island. Our other apps are $4.99, Ebley Island, Ebley Space, and Ebley Sight Words by Sound. By So meaning high frequency words that we do by sound and groupings as well as homophones. So lots of, lots of integrated instruction in those three, and you can put however many kids you have, you can put them all on, and not at the same time, but on a same, the app on the same device too. So I would recommend that too. And then go to that Facebook page and, and learn some more and watch some webinars and, and all, um, you know, and do that exploring. 
um, because this is overwhelming. This is overwhelming for teachers. It can be overwhelming for, for parents. You know, there's so much excitement and interest in like, especially I think with So the Story and, and Emily Hanford's podcast there, that people are like, oh my gosh, it's from balanced literacy, we've got to change. Or from parents who are like, my child isn't making progress after all these years, what do I need to do? So we're desperate. And then we're kind of overloaded with so much information. So I would say start with simpler things. And to me, reading reflex is a, is a great place to start as a parent, I would say, even as a teacher, quite frankly. Okay. I think we have, we've gone through most of the questions. They were, a lot of them were answered already. Um, so I think we're good. Let's see here. Anyone else? Anyone else want to? Yeah, you can unmute if you have something to say or ask or whatever. I am happy to answer that if you would like. Everybody, I do have one more question. I'm I'm the parent with the Down syndrome child. Ah. Um. So he also has speech issues, of course. So um, would I have to really? more on him just listening to me say the sounds and him attempt to make the sounds correctly knowing that he's not there yet yeah and what and, and what's interesting and i don't know why another thing i'd like to have research is that when we do ably we've had kids whose speech were was so um garbled we had no idea what they were saying they could be their family could interpret for them we had no idea and the more that they did this the more that they weren't speaking, you know, the, the articulation was not all clear for sure, but it was definitely understandable, which was a huge shift. So there's something in that. And I think it has to do with you're starting with the whole word and then you're going to the sounds. And what I would say is have him have him pair it. OK, say mm, and then he says it, say ah, and then he says it. OK, mm -hmm. you can talk about your mouth and where you're going to hold it because you have when you their motor control and motor move problem with the oral motor issues mm -hmm. are, are the food all over the place all that kind of stuff and talking about where you're holding your mouth very small percentage of kids we need to do that kind of instruction for mm -hmm. but just using a mirror to show show and tell always think of show and tell right show and tell is not just for kindergarten show and tell is anytime you teach anything but especially if there's more challenges with it so doing that show and tell and expecting mm -hmm. We're going to get this and the speech is going to come. And when you go from that whole word to the parts to the whole word, which is what we're doing in structured linguistic literacy, there's something that happens with the speech. Um, and I don't know what to say about it, but we've seen it happen enough times um, that that articulation will come as opposed to do it in isolation. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank Let's you. Try that. Yep. Okay. It's almost Thanks. like therapy because you are really slowing down the speech and you're, re you're requiring mm -hmm. them to say the words slowly. Yeah. And really segmented with a and segmenting. A, 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 yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. I know so he will. There's a double purpose there. Yes. I know he'll always have certain issues with certain sounds that he may never overcome. But I know, I mean, his he takes in more than we know so sure. and, and you know this is what i'm going to say and i don't i say this regardless of whatever it is the bar goes here okay right. you just keep going and pushing for there and we're not there yet but now okay now what do we need to do differently um we you know we have had kids one who had part of his brain removed and was not i mean no hope from anybody else and we're like oh no 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 we're not going to go there this is where the bar is and we're going to get there it was a lot of hard work it was a lot of hard work um and he got there and now his mom was like he'll never be out of the our, my basement he's always going to be well now he's on his own he has his own he's Ooh. you know um so so bringing that bar up and really you know keep pushing keep pushing keep pushing you know shift push shift yeah yeah and i think you'll be amazed yeah okay very good um Talk about the book, uh, Louisa Moat's book, Speech to Print. Is that what you're talking about or is that different? It is not what I'm talking about. Um, her book does has good um, information. I just brought the, I think it's in the front seat of my car, actually. Uh, information on the theory of speech to print. But whenever you have anything, and then she her the instruction is more letter first focus. So it's a speech to print 
um, mindset of how the language is oriented. But the, and it's really like Diane McGinnis, quite frankly, for me, Diane McGinnis had this brilliant theory, but then she had these allographs or something this, that didn't make any sense to me. I'm like, this is not how you're saying to teach the kids. And she really didn't teach kids, but it didn't, it wasn't logical, didn't make sense to me for her stuff. But for, with Louisa Motes, if, if you ever have where the letters are leading the instruction, which means anytime there's a rule or the syllable types or the letters first or a letter in isolation, we're, we're teaching the approaches print first, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is different than the, so, so she's talking about speech to print as far as it has to do with spelling and all of that kind of stuff. The speech to print approach is integrated all of it, spelling, reading, writing, handwriting, all those, all of the things, the phonemic words, phonics, all those things integrated and, and presented differently. And the beginning, like I say, part of her book is that theory talking about differently, but the presentation of the code is still from a print to speech approach. So this is not what we're talking about with that. Yeah. Good question. Okay, very good. Um, I just had another one and I lost it. I'm so yeah, sorry. I know that's the problem with the um I could see um, I'm nowhere near anywhere. Donna, I did see a, an interesting question. If you do this after school working with them or and, and then or in school even, how do you deal with you know in school when they're learning rules and and, and everything else? Mm. Oh, so how do they handle the yeah? You know, that's a good question. We have a reading center also, and we have had since 1999. And we have a waiting list now that poor Cricket's getting very stressed out. 139 people are on it now. Um, so, and we get through them fairly quickly. So almost everybody that comes to our reading center is going back either into balanced literacy or traditional phonics as their instruction in the school. Now, the interesting thing I would say, the vast majority until about the last year of our clients have come with a strong balanced literacy background. Now we're having a lot of kids coming also with a traditional phonics background and many, if not most, are have a combo. And our, our Ebley therapists here have been coming to me and saying, the kids are getting worse. This is the problem. They're guessing and looking at the picture and they're doing the letter name and all these rules. They're doing four things that we have to undo and they hold on to them so tight. So it does take us a little bit longer to undo the things that are not, you know, they're not finding efficient for them, right? But what we're teaching them, if it makes more sense and it's more logical and it works, especially if they're not being pulled out for other stuff and if there's third, second, third grade and above where there's really not any more reading instruction happening, they, it's more of a problem in those younger grades where there's a lot more focus on those strategies. So it will overcome. It's just what, that's what we've always done is, is, um, you know, we tell them to use these strategies when they're in their classroom or when they're at a restaurant or when, whatever they're reading, this is something that you use always. So yeah, that's how we deal with it. And we do typically we don't tell them, but we say to parents, if you take them out of this additional remediation pullout, I would ask the school to take them out of that, you know, transitionally while you're working with us so that you don't have conflicting instruction that, that slows things down. So that, that's what we do too. Okay. Thanks for asking. All right. Um, do you offer certification for people who want to be trained in the Ebley method? We certainly do. Anybody can be trained in it, and we do. Um, we have, we've even had a high schooler that was trained in it, yes. We are in schools and we have a lot of school. Ideally, in my mind, I'd like to be in K-3 classrooms because putting the fence at the top of the cliff, but we have a tremendous amount of interest with remediation and intervention in homeschoolers, um, for sure, too. So it doesn't matter. Nobody at my center has a background in education. So that's not a prerequisite, including myself, yeah. Okay. Someone asked about where the greatest need is in preschool or school age or high school, I would say. <laughs> the greatest need that most people become panicky is about third and fourth grade. And I think that there's a, uh, and then it increases over time and that before giving up really. And I think that the reasoning for that, depending on where you're coming from, uh, in school, that's when state testing typically starts. Um, and, and that's problematic. Also parents and school 
third grade is when almost everybody starts to fall apart because their memory's maxed out and they can't pour any more in there um, to try to get beyond that. When we have 50 year olds come to our center, they're at about a third grade level. 10th graders at about a third grade level. Fifth graders at about a third grade level. So then it becomes a problem um, that they aren't able to manage anything. They've been able to wing it, kind of like my daughter did, up kind of into second grade. But third grade, the wheels start to fall off. In fourth grade, the wheels really start to fall off. And then also behavior problems, depression, anxiety, all of those things, you know, kind of start to pile on where there's a lot more concern all the way around. So the greatest need, in my opinion, is preschool, kindergarten, first grade, if we teach it there, then we don't, we can avoid and circumvent all of those issues that are beyond. But mm -hmm. there's such like the jails, they're a great need. The military, they're a great need. This business that called me, 80% of their people can't read and they've got to do reading and writing with a new system that they have and they can't read. You know, the need is so tremendous and overwhelming that we can only, you know, we can go. But ideally where it needs to be is beginning instruction in school, in the classroom, in my opinion. So yeah, there's a lot of work to be done, but we can do it together. We can do it for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would request that everyone who's on uh, download the chat. So you go to the bottom of the chat and on the right-hand side are three dots. If you click on that, you're going to see the message save chat press that and you'll save chat to your computer so you can go back because there's a lot of information in this wow. chat. Lots of um, comments being made uh, from the experts in Ebley. So um, we are going to call it a night and thank you, Nora, for your expertise and your, again, your passion and your, your, um, your wisdom really. Um, well, you know, this. I want to say to you, Donna, that I didn't say at the beginning that I had in my head and it didn't come out was that I thank you like so tremendously for your openness, for your openness and your curiosity and your willing to change and your truly your willingness to do what's best for kids and right. the people are teaching them. You are an angel and a gem and we're all very lucky to mm -hmm. have you. So whether you're moving or not and going crazy, and all, <laughs> you're still absolutely spectacular and amazing. So thank you. Thank you. We just won't be close to each other with the uh, our proximity, but it'll be. Okay. I feel like I'm going to be closer to you where you're going, because where you are up there in the middle of having to go across the whole world, I think I'm going to be closer <laughs> in Tennessee. I can get to there. Yeah. Tell me about it. Tell me about it. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you guys all for coming. I appreciate it. Great conversation. Good question. Bye. Yes. Where do you get Ebley training? Um, if you go to ebley.com, you can find out there. Or if you email, there's a go to ebley.com, there's a contact us form. You can say, hey, how do I deal with this? And we will give you everything that you need. How's that sound? Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. I have a dear cousin that I love very much. Her name's Maureen. Oh, I would love to throw another quick question out. I know Donna, you said to download the chat. Somehow I got my Zoom unexpectedly quit. So when I rejoined, I'm missing all the chat from yep. before. Is there any other way of sharing that? I am going to, I will download it and I'm going to list it on the, um, the uh, as a Google Doc on the YouTube channel. It'll be there under this um, presentation. Fantastic. Thank you so Donna. much. You're, you're welcome. The YouTube, the YouTube channel is... Um, it's you know, uh, Science of Reading, What I Should Have Learned in College, YouTube. Yep. You just go to YouTube and type that in and you will find it. And then the, also the other ones, Marnie Ginsburg's, Janine Heron, and all of them, plus a gazillion other things that Donna has on there. There's, it's a wealth of wonderful things. So, so Donna, Donna, how do you say your last name? Hey, Monic. Hey, Monic, or Hype Manic, H-E-J-T. M-A-N-E-K. You, you can type in that and it'll also pop up. Yep. Okay, it's good, thanks. Good stuff. It's a good place to visit. All, All right. right. Hey, Hannah, can you um, put a link to the Ebley Community Facebook group? Oh, yeah. That's a good point. Um, yes, that's another thing. If you want to know more about Ebley, those of you asking questions, that's an excellent, Nikki, you are amazing to Ebley Community Facebook page. Go to Ebley Community and check that out. What it is, is part trained Ebley people and part curious about Ebley people. 
in the interactions there, we really don't jump in too much to there. People go back and forth in talking about their questions and other people answer. And it's it's really amazing. It's quite uplifting. It's a lovely place to be. So if you have questions and you're wondering, that's a great place to go. So thank you for that, Nikki. Yes. All right, everyone. All right. Stop recording. All right. Thank you, dear.